Chapter Twenty Nine of the Hand of Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Twenty Nine. Lama Sorcery. From my post in the chair by the window, I could see two sides of the court below that immediately opposite with the entrance to some chambers situated there and that on the right with the cloisteresque arches beyond which lay a maze of old-world passages and stairs whereby one who knew the tortuous navigation might come ultimately to the embankment it was this side of the court which lay in deepest shadow by altering my position quite slightly i could command a view of the arched entrance on the left with its pale lamp and an iron bracket above and of the high blank wall whose otherwise unbroken expanse it interrupted all was very still only on occasions the passing of a vehicle along fleet street would break the silence the nature of the danger that threatened i was wholly unable to surmise since my pistol on the table beside me i sat on guard at the window and smith also armed watched the outer door it was not apparent by what agency the shadowy enemy could hope to come at us something strange i had detected in nayland smith's manner however which had induced me to believe that he suspected if he did not know what form of menace hung over us in the darkness one thing in particular was puzzling me extremely if smith doubted the good faith of the sender of the message why had he acted upon it thus my mind worked in endless and profitless cycles whilst my eyes were ever searching the shadows below me and as i watched wondering vaguely why smith at his post was so silent presently i became aware of the presence of a slim figure over by the arches on the right this discovery did not come suddenly nor did it surprise me i merely observed without being conscious of any great interest in the matter that someone was standing in the court below looking up at me where i sat I cannot hope to explain my state of mind at that moment, to render understandable by contrast with the cold fear which had visited me so recently, the utter apathy of my mental attitude. To this day I cannot recapture the mood, and for a very good reason, though one that was not apparent to me at the time. It was the Eurasian girl, Zarmi, who was standing there, looking up at the window. Silently I watched her. Why was I silent? why did i not warn smith of the presence of one of dr fu manchu's servants i cannot explain although later the strangeness of my behaviour may become in some measure understandable zarmi raised her hand beckoning to me then stepped back revealing the presence of a companion hitherto masked by the dense shadows that lay under the arches this second watcher moved slowly forward and i perceived him to be none other than the mandarin kai ming this i noted with interest but with a sort of impersonal interest as i might have watched the entrance of a character upon the stage of a theatre despite the feeble light i could see his benign countenance very clearly but far from being excited a dreamy contentment possessed me i actually found myself hoping that smith would not intrude upon my reverie what a fascinating pageant it had been the fu manchu drama from the moment that i had first set eyes upon the yellow doctor again i seemed to be enacting my part in that scene two years ago and more when i had burst into the bare room above shen yan's opium den and had stood face to face with dr fu manchu he wore a plain yellow robe its hue almost identical with that of his gaunt hairless face his elbows rested upon the dirty table and his pointed chin upon his long bony hands into those uncanny eyes i stared those eyes long narrow and slightly oblique their brilliant cat-like greenness sometimes horribly filmed like the eyes of some grotesque bird thus it began and from this point i was carried on step by step through every episode great and small it was such a retrospect as passes through the mind of one drowning with a vividness that was terrible yet exquisite, I saw Karamina, my lost love. I saw her first wrapped in a hooded opera cloak, with her flower-like face and glorious dark eyes raised to me. I saw her in the gauzy eastern raiment of a slave-girl, and I saw her in the dress of a gypsy. Through moments sweet and bitter I lived again, through hours of suspense and days of ceaseless watching, through the long months of that first summer when my unhappy love came to me and on and on interminably on 
For years I lived again beneath that ghastly yellow cloud. I searched throughout the land of Egypt for Karamina and knew once more the sorrow of losing her. Time ceased to exist for me. Then, at the end of these strenuous years, I came at last to my meeting with Kai Ming in the room with the golden door. At this point my visionary adventures took a new turn. I sat again upon the red-covered couch and listened, half stupefied, to the placid speech of the Mandarin. Again I came under the spell of his singular personality, and again, closing my eyes, I consented to be led from the room. But, having crossed the threshold, a sudden awful doubt passed through my mind, arrow-like. The hand that held my arm was bony and clawish. I could detect the presence of incredibly long fingernails, nails long as those of some buried vampire of the Black Ages. Choking down a cry of horror, I opened my eyes, heedless of the promise given but a few moments earlier, and looked into the face of my guide. It was Dr. Fu Manchu. Never, dreaming or waking, have I known a sensation identical with that which now clutched my heart. I thought that it must be death. For ages, untold ages, eons longer than the world has known, I looked into that still, awful face, into those unnatural green eyes. I jerked my hand free from the Chinaman's clutch and sprang back. As I did so, I became miraculously translated from the threshold of the room with the golden door to our chambers in the court adjoining Fleet Street. I came into full possession of my faculties, or believed so at the time. I realized that I had nodded at my post, that I had dreamed a strange dream, but I realized something else. A ghoulish presence was in the room. Snatching up my pistol from the table I turned, like some evil jinn of Arabian lore, Dr. Fu Manchu, surrounded by a slight mist, stood looking at me. Instantly I raised the pistol, leveled it steadily at the high dome-like brow, and fired. There could be no possibility of missing at such short range, no possibility whatever. And in the very instant of pulling the trigger the mist cleared, the lineaments of Dr. Fu Manchu melted magically. This was not the Chinese doctor who stood before me, at whose skull I still was pointing the deadly little weapon, into whose brain I had fired the bullet. It was Nayland Smith. Kai Ming, by means of the unholy arts of the Lamas of the Rashiran, had caused me to murder my best friend. Smith, I whispered huskily, God forgive me, what have I done? What have I done? I stepped forward to support him ere he fell, but utter oblivion closed down upon me, and I knew no more. He will do quite well now said a voice that seemed to come from a vast distance. The effects of the drug will have entirely worn off when he wakes, except that there may be nausea, possibly some muscular pain for a time. I opened my eyes. They were throbbing agonizingly. I lay in bed, and beside me stood Murdoch McCabe, the famous toxicological expert from Charing Cross Hospital, and Nayland Smith. Oh, that's better, cried McCabe cheerily. Here, yeah, drink this. I drank from the glass which he raised to my lips. I was too weak for speech, too weak for wonder. Nayland Smith, his face grey and drawn in the cold light of early morning, watched me anxiously. McCabe, in a matter-of-fact way that acted upon me like a welcome tonic, put several purely medical questions, which at first by dint of great effort, but with ever-increasing ease, I answered. Yes, he said musingly at last. Of course it is all but impossible to speak with certainty, but I am disposed to think that you have been drugged with some preparation of hashish. The most likely is that known in eastern countries as Megon or Barsh, composed of equal parts of cannabis indica and opium, with hellebore and other constituents, which vary according to the purpose which the Megon is intended to serve. This renders the subject particularly open to subjective hallucination, and a pliable instrument in the hands of a hypnotic operator, for instance. "'You see, old man,' cried Smith eagerly, "'you see?' But I shook my head weakly. "'I shot you,' I said. "'It is impossible that I could have missed.' "'Mr. Smith has placed me in possession of the facts,' interrupted McCabe, "'and I can outline with reasonable certainty what took place. Of course it's all very amazing, utterly fantastic, in fact.' but I have met with almost parallel cases in Egypt and India, and elsewhere in the East. Never in London, I'll confess. You see, Dr. Petrie, you are taken into the presence of a very accomplished hypnotist, having been previously prepared by a stiff administration of Megon. 
you are doubtless familiar with the remarkable experiments in psychotherapeutics conducted at the salpetrier in paris and you will readily understand me when i say that prior to your recovering consciousness in the presence of the mandarin kai ming you had received your hypnotic instructions these were to be put into execution either at a certain time duly impressed upon your drugged mind or at a given signal it was a signal snapped smith kai ming stood in the court below and looked up at the window i objected in that event snapped smith he would have spoken softly through the letter-box of the door you immediately resumed your interrupted trance continued mccabe and by hypnotic suggestion impressed upon you earlier in the evening you were ingeniously led up to a point at which under what delusion i know not you fired at mr smith i had the privilege of studying an almost parallel case in simla where an officer was fatally stabbed by his khitmatgar a most faithful servant acting under the hypnotic prompting of a certain fakir whom the officer had been unwise enough to chastise the fakir paid for the crime with his life i may add the khitmatgar shot him ten minutes later i had no chance at kaiming snapped smith he vanished like a shadow but has played his big card and lost henceforth he is a hunted man and he knows it oh he cried seeing me watching him in bewilderment i suspected some llama trickery old man and i kept closely to the arrangements proposed by the mandarin but kept you under careful observation but smith i shot you it was impossible to miss i agree but do you recall the report the report i was too dazed too horrified by the discovery of what i had done there was no report petrie i am not entirely a stranger to indo-chinese jugglery and you had a very strange look in your eyes therefore i took the precaution of unloading your browning End of chapter twenty nine